let's get back and get our feet on the ground here and go to phosphoric acid fuel cells. Now, this kind of a fuel cell is larger than the proton exchange membrane fuel cell. Traditionally, 200 kilowatts. And what's depicted here is a map of California where each of these red dots depicts a deployment of a stationary fuel cell. Today, we have over 33 megawatts deployed. And for the phosphoric acid fuel cell, an example is here in St. Helena at uh, their hospital and right here in San Diego at uh, Albertson's uh, grocery store chain here in California. That's a 400 kilowatt fuel cell. The manufacturer you can barely see right here is UTC Power, a business unit of United Technologies Corporation. This has really been the front runner for stationary fuel cells. More than 330 probably deployed around the world right now, been commercial for 15 years. Uh, this is an example of deployment by the Department of Defense around the US of that product and evaluating its operation at various climatic, uh, uh, clim climatic conditions. Molten carbonate fuel cells and solid oxide fuel cells are really what we call HTFC, which stands for high temperature fuel cells. You can just see quite a bit higher temperatures. These are the next generation, new generation of stationary fuel cells. If we look first at the molten carbonate as an example, here is a one megawatt deployment at California State University at Northridge. Really interesting that a conservative customer would actually decide to put a very advanced technology at their campus. UC San Diego is deploying 2.4 megawatts of this same technology as we speak. But there are other applications in California. Up in uh, Chico right here, there's a Sierra Nevada brewery, which has one megawatt. Make sure you forever now consume only Sierra Nevada <laughs> beer. Uh, in the middle of the state, in Tulare, there's a wastewater treatment plant with three 300 kilowatt units for a total of 900 kilowatts. What's important for you to grasp here is that this is an example of a stationary fuel cell operating on a renewable fuel, the anaerobic digester gas that Dr. Thomas referred to. And then again, back down in San Diego, the Sheraton Hotel with 1.5 megawatts. And today, this molten carbonate product, which comes from a company in Danbury, Connecticut, Fuel Cell Energy, constitutes almost 75% of this total deployment right now in California over an interesting portfolio of, of applications. Well, that leaves us with the solid oxide fuel cell. Uh, many think that's a holy grail because of the anticipated long stack life that it should have, you know, solid oxide, much like a electronic chip. And the player there is a company that you probably haven't heard of, Bloom Energy. <laughs> Uh, a California company in, in Mountain View. We became aware of it as a public more than a year ago in February through a 60 Minutes piece, and you probably have heard us talk about the Bloom Box. Here's the Bloom Box, 100 kilowatts. This is a deployment at eBay, five of them for a half a megawatt. Here is 400 kilowatts deployed at, uh, uh, at Google. Uh, and it's garnering a lot of press and popularity. About 25% of the 33 megawatts today in California is of uh, the Bloom uh, technology. So this kind of gives you a nice feel of the evolution of a stationary. But we were talking about the role in hydrogen. So let's get to that now. These two types of fuel cells, remember they're the high temperature fuel cells. And if we take them and combine them with the automobile fuel cell, we get something like this. So we looked at this, right? This is the stationary application. And I'm going to focus on this fuel processor because you can see it's producing hydrogen. And it makes you think, well, if it's producing hydrogen, can we not take that hydrogen and utilize it for fueling a automobile? Not a bad idea, but will it really work? So here's our hydrogen station. This is the UCI station, the most 
in demand in the world right now. That's going to change rapidly, but it's been quite an interesting experience for us to be utilizing this for all of the OEMs. Think about bringing in a fuel cell operated natural gas that provides electricity to a customer, thermal energy to a customer, and on demand as it's needed. You just turn on the spigot, provides hydrogen to refuel the station. That's, that's, that's the concept. This is an energy station producing electricity, a thermal product, and hydrogen. If we go back for a moment to the blueprint plan and look at the glossary, you see energy station right here. It's got a pretty impressive definition, but it basically says that an energy station utilizes distributed generation at its fun as its fundamental anchor. It's the economic basis for the station, and then hydrogen comes along for the ride. So one way to think about that is this picture where you see the fuel cell producing as we intend it to, electricity at a thermal load, and then as you wish or need, you extract out hydrogen for the uh, station. So this can be done, but what's remarkable about this is this word right here. There's a synergy or synergism that occurs created through this, where by taking hydrogen out, we're actually increasing the efficiency of the fuel cell. And that can be depicted by putting into the fuel cell 100 units of natural gas of energy and getting out what we expect, electricity, 47, and this high temperature thermal product, 53. These are megajoules. To describe this synergism to you, if I now extract out hydrogen, I call that tri-generation. As I said, it increases the efficiency. So let's demonstrate that by just increasing the amount of energy going into here by 43 units. I pick that because if I do that, I can retain the same amount of electricity being generated and the same amount of waste heat that can be captured and utilized. But I get now this 43 megajoules in hydrogen at virtually no cost of energy. I'm going to kind of leave it at that except to say that we can even go a step further. We can take the natural gas and replace it with a biogas. Then we get a renewable biohydrogen. And Dr. Thomas alluded to this with the use of anaerobic digester gas, which is available to us in a wastewater treatment plant, which is using today natural gas and ADG for a boiler to heat up the digester, what we're finding is that we can replace that boiler with a fuel cell, use that high quality heat that would otherwise be exhausted to support that digester, and then produce electricity. Um, I showed you this example where that's being done today, about 10 megawatts of electrical production in California today at a variety of wastewater treatment plants doing just this. But what's special here in this application is the production on demand of biohydrogen. So my line was stolen. Flush the toilet and get energy. I, so I thank you for that. Or when Alan wrote about this a few years ago, he said, uh, toilet to tank technology. <laughs> This is a technology that evolved the National Fuel Cell Research Center and is now being deployed at the Orange County Sanitation District with the commissioning expected now to be uh, August uh, 2011. Uh, right now, the system is producing hydrogen with natural gas. The AD skid is arriving this week, and we expect to be producing biohydrogen within a few weeks and then the full commissioning in about two or three months. So this is a strategic alliance with fuel cell energy, air products, and the National Fuel Cell Research Center. Let me conclude by just showing you a view of the Long Beach area in 2060, in this case, an assumption of the number of fuel cell vehicles being 75% of the total population. In order to kind of garner what we might have by way of, of infrastructure, these little red dots represent the hydrogen fueling stations, which we've determined need to be about 10% 
of the existing gasoline stations today in order to provide the same level of service. Uh, these blue dots represent uh, central steam methane reformation that Dr. Thomas uh, described uh, being positioned at uh, areas that now have oil and gas infrastructure. But this is all complemented with these little yellow dots, distributed generation of high temperature fuel cells, locally producing electricity in a thermal product, selling it to a customer, and then utilizing the hydrogen to serve a local uh, gasoline station that's now been outfitted with hydrogen fueling capability. So now you see on this chart that we've populated the electric grid with fuel cells, not only at office buildings, but at industry. We have them at the homes. Here's the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this is what's called a tiger station, transmission integrated grid energy resource for utility uh, grid support. But what we're depicting here though is distributed generation and hydrogen, correct? So here we have with the renewable, that Orange County Sanitation District example. But with natural gas, we can also provide it at the local office building, can provide it at the uh, Costco or the local industrial plant or distribution center. Uh, we also are anticipating the provision at these tiger stations of hydrogen. A lot of work is being done today, of course, in producing renewable energy here for the hydrogen future. We're anticipating and, of course, doing and expecting to do that and then pipe it into the urban area. What you may not know about is the extensive amount of work that's going on with future central plants that would co-generate hydrogen as a transportation fuel. But I'm getting away from myself here because we're supposed to be focusing on distributed generation. Whereas we've seen somewhere in the future, we may also have refueling here at the home as well. Thank you. <laughs>